Hello, how are we doing? Feeling good after lunch? Perfect. All right, so let's go ahead and get started the next few moments. All right, thank you. So I'm sure a few of you have already heard a few times a day, so I'm sorry that I'm repeating it. It's getting annoying at this point. But I am Brianna Williams, and I'm a lecturer in the Comparative Media Studies and Writing Department here at MIT. This afternoon, I will be introducing Dr. Kelly Moore, Associate Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication at NYU, and the author of the newly released work, Legal Spectatorship, Slavery and the Visual Culture of Domestic Violence, which I highly recommend, by the way. At Bearing Witness Seeking Justice, we hope to incorporate creative forms of media, namely visual media, in our development of new frameworks for social justice. In Dr. Moore's work, she furthers our understanding of how the image of domestic violence has altered and can continue to alter legal and extralegal spaces. She does so by examining how witness testimony and witness flesh is translated and transformed once absorbed into legal processes and the political knowledge surrounding domestic violence. She uncovers historical and ongoing efforts by state powers to subjugate the presentation of both the crime and the victims without full regard for their autonomy or consent, ultimately compromising their agency as they seek justice. It's not difficult to expand our interpretation of the domestic sphere and project its implications beyond the private household. In our national home, the United States, and beyond its borders, state-sanctioned violence occurs daily, and it's the images of these abuse, their uses, interpretations, their transmutations, that have often maintained the recurrence of a violent history, but now offer us the tools with which we can re redefine that history. If only we hold fast to our agency, as Dr. Moore posits, through mediation, authentication, and solidarity. Since earning her PhD at UC San Diego, completing her postdoctoral fellowship at UC Berkeley, and publishing extensively, Dr. Moore has found a new home for her vital research. At the Center for the Humanities, she continues exploring the potential of a method used in her past work, courtroom watching, to further expose media history, its use of trauma narratives, and the popularization of certain forms of evidence, some real and others falsified. No doubt, understanding the pre-existing frameworks that define courtroom aesthetics will allow us further agency in forming our own in the pursuit of justice, namely legal justice, which is why I'm so excited today to be introducing Dr. Kelly Moore in her presentation, Moving Images in Absentia, Courtroom Looking in the Age of Hypermediation. Welcome, Kelly. <laughs> Um, thank you very, very much, Brianna, for that very kind introduction. Um, and I want to express my tremendous gratitude to Professor Kenneth Manning for hosting this event and inviting me to it. A very generous, very generous um, invitation. As well as Samantha Fletcher, who helped with a number of link, uh, logistical issues, and, and everyone else who, whose hands and labor touched this conference in any way. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really wonderful uh, to be here. Um, and I would like um, to also thank the fellow, fellow scholars here, whose critical and steadfast efforts toward the question of visual culture and criminal justice are shifting our ability to understand what so many repressed and silenced communities have already known and experienced of the mediation of criminal justice and its origins in the Anglo-American legal context. Um, so I am a, a scholar whose work brings together law, media, um, black studies, and I'm interested in how we come to the truth, the milieus through which we come to the truth, um, the architectures that we use, the spaces that we inhabit to come to legal decisions. I'm interested in questions of what makes something testimonial, and that's what I'll talk about today uh, using some materials from, from my book. And then in, if there's time, and that's actually maybe the better argument, um, if there's time, I'll talk about a project that um, comes out of, of my first monograph. This symposium has brought together a number of leading scholars conducting some of our deepest inquiries into the identity and origins of photographic evidence. 
the affective dimension of photographic evidence, videography and its influence on expressive and narrative legal cultures. The work has expanded the analytical lens of video by emphasizing the sonic elements of videography, making ways um, of, hearing the, of hearing the image coeval um, with ways of seeing the image. Importantly, these timely projects here at the conference do not take for granted the presumption of the availability of the audience as structuring of the history of witnessing and its political importance. The need for evidentiary photography and moving images assumes an audience to view it, post it, like it, tweet it, comment, follow, curate. This is where I'll try to, uh, to focus a few interventions and provocations. This afternoon, my remarks are concerned with the interaction of law and visual culture in the era of ubiquitous social media. And I will submit that our, our political moment where we depend less and less on formerly trained media professionals, i.e. traditional journalists, for documentation of state oppression in a time of greater awareness of cultures and amnesia, where the routines of police work are ever more scrutinized by a techno-savvy public, we need to return to those spaces where the live production of recording is forbidden, absented, erased, confiscated, left unthought, under-theorized, to comprehend the limits of public witnessing in order to strategize where to push further to access a more thoughtful critique, more transformed justice, more life. I'll put the provocation up first. Is it possible that the democratization and decentralization of, the so of social media technology we use to proliferate our witnessing participates in the centralization of state control through courtroom power? Second, how do we put into conversation the fact that the US public, um, that in the US, public witnessing is on the increase in the same political moment courtroom trials are on the decline? And I'll talk more about that. Legal scholar Jocelyn Simonson draws our attention to our current post-trial world in which 95% of criminal convictions result from plea bargains, meaning that juries have fewer roles and responsibilities to, to represent the public in courtroom trials. Today, bearing witness is mediated by Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok in ways that should make us curious for the whereabouts of juries, but also, and more importantly, wonder about the status of the courtroom and its audience which is to say that bearing witness should also happen in the courtroom more. This talk is about the space and social dynamics of courtrooms where photography and videography are interdicted. As such, my talk today focuses on the control over uh, recording visual evidence in the courtroom milieu. And by courtroom milieu, I mean the historical communication pathways between law enforcement's um, criminal investigation and the players in the courtroom, judges, police, attorneys, court officers, juries, and the audience. I suggest that the absence of photography and, vid and videography has a binary and closed circuit relation to the proliferation of photography and videography, which demand our attention. The proliferation of citizen photography and videography and analysis must be understood as a system of cybernetic control, which I'll explain a little bit later. In the spirit of a feminist killjoy, I'll offer some cautionary points and clarifications concerning the social media transformation of public witnessing and its interdisciplinary study. These points and clarifications will draw from examples from my own study of the ascendance of visual evidence in domestic violence in the US courtroom and public culture. I'll then turn to how this study um, expanded into a, a founding of a court watch uh, at my university. So, um, I came to this project uh, through looking at uh, or coming across images of battered women um, in a, a, life, a few, couple of lifetimes ago uh, when I was working um, in a courthouse as a researcher uh, in, in, uh, in New York. And I'm gonna show a couple of those images. And this is sort of, I guess it's my, my trigger warning which I completely de deconstruct with students. Um, the images, a few of them are authentic but the majority of them are, um, are art and performance pieces. Um, these are cosmetically simulated domestic violence images. Uh, this is a, an actress whose name I forget and a, a model. These are images used to advertise public awareness of domestic violence um, 
this one here uh, for the Baltimore Ra Ravens um, and the Super Bowl and the, upt the uptick in domestic violence um, uh, during the Super Bowl. Um, and this is another, just an, an interview with an actress, I believe for People Magazine, where they stage her in this way because reasons. Um, these are faked images. Um, images like these began for me a macabre connoisseurship of some really unsavory digital files. And this is the conference for that because I think of London, all of the scholars here have this collection of, of, of really unsavory material. Um, and one of the affordances of social media is its flexibility in modifying, filtering, deconstructing, and simulating the truth. While trick photography has been around since the inception of the medium, and rituals of cosmetics even longer, the ubiquity of social media, particularly digital photography, has brought ever more opportunities to fake it. Faking it in this case, in this case the wounds of domestic abuse, using social media has also made its way into law. When I allowed myself to be led by representational motif and genre, as is typical in photography studies, these images were about violence against women. What Marianne Hirsch studies, uh, among other things, um, is the idea of post-memory. They, they were about that. Um, they had also to do with the shadow archive of 19th century domestic portraiture. They have to do with what Karen Shimakala, Karen Shimakala might call national objection. The sauciness of the images, um, and here um, I'll show you this um, image of Donna Ferrato, who's a, a photographer who is embedded uh, with a, a husband and wife named Garth and Lisa uh, in, in the early 1980s. She was working for an issue of Japanese Playboy um, on countercultural uh, marriages. And so she was embedded living with them um, with her young child at the time. And she's following them around and one night she witnesses this fight and she very famously uh, documents this, this violence. Ferrado's piece was cut for being obscene, and she caught a lot of flack for taking the picture rather than intervening, right? I'll show you with this other photograph. I'm going to show it quickly. Um, it's of the artist Anna Mendieta, who, while she was getting her MFA at uh, University of Iowa, she was, by the way, known for working with animal blood. Um, a lot of the male artists were doing the same. Um, a murder happened uh, while she was in school, and what she was moved to engage in a series of performances, which she called Tableau of Violence, where she read the police material about, that, that described this murder of this young woman on campus. And she sort of replicated um, what the police found. And she invited some friends over to her home one evening, posed in the way that this young woman's body had been found. She didn't say anything to the guest. It was a project that involved duration, and she is sloped over um, a table. Here's the image really quickly. Um, and eventually, the, the folks that she invited to her home started taking photographs and talked about what they saw. Um, Anna Mendieta was herself a victim of domestic violence, and her husband, the minimalist sculptor Carl Andre, was accused of pushing her out of a high-raised building many years uh, later. Um, and like, as I said, this was a project that was part of her early juvenilia, you might, you might call it. And I got interested in this period of feminist art performance. Um, it's at a moment in the 1980s where there were calls by critical um, white feminist artists who were saying what we need to do um, is stop following the, tradition, the male tradition of representing our bodies and take our bodies out of circulation. Stop appearing nude in our art. Stop making our art be about our naked form. And what made me interested in these images, given what I had shown you about the faked um, domestic violence uh, public um, public awareness campaigns was the fact that these women were not doing that. These artists and photojournalists were, were straying from that. And what I found really compelling was that though these are forms of art performance, they were actually mimicking a new form of police photography of domestic violence uh, of battered women. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that it's precisely this, these kinds of images that got the police to take domestic violence seriously, right? Previously, um, for decades, the police would ask uh, 
Carl, the husband, to take a walk around the block, right? And nothing really was done about, about what was happening domestically. Um, here is another of the uh, famous photographer, Nan Golden. Um, this is a, an authentic image. Um, the image, uh, she calls the image Nan one month after being beaten. And she, it's an image of her with a black eye that she received from an ex-boyfriend. And she's also um, put rouge, put makeup uh, on her face. Sorry. Ooh. Okay, this is a, an image that she would show regularly um, in an in a art performance piece that, that she did in the 1980s, very famous photograph of her. Um, and what was compelling about this image is the makeup and the bruise together. Um, in all of these cosmetically simulated images, what I find um, compelling is the fact that makeup is being used in a, in a, in a radical, makeup is being radicalized, right? Makeup is being used in this activist way um, makeup being sort of one of, the, one of the essences of feminine masquerade, like one of the ways that you highlight femininity, one of the ways that you highlight womanhood. And so I was quite interested in the ways that makeup could be used by um, these female, these women activists in this way. And this particular image that I just showed you kind of has those two things going on at the same time. Okay. Um, so how did we get to this place of advertising law um, by circulating faked images of the very real evidence um, needed during domestic violence trials. Rather than exclusively following the configuration of women's bodies in these images, right, where have I seen this configuration of bodies before, right, rather than ask that question, the motifs of genre that, I've, um, that have organized film, and these are the, mo the motifs and genres that have um, organized film and photography studies, I was led instead by the dominant terms we use to refer to these images images of battered women, pictures of intimate partner violence, domestic violence, images of DV. The images are used to advertise the medical legal term, is it, sorry, the, these images are used to advertise the medical legal terms for a particular kind of victim of a particular violent crime. These images were also used to bring awareness to policy changes brought about by the bipartisan efforts of the Violence Against Women Act of 1994, which I'll talk more about shortly. What I wanted to do, however, was not merely tell the story of these images in terms of their, um, the more prominent content, but rather to see what forms of law were represented through the image. Um, and so I was really thinking about domestic violence, that term. And if you are um, in any way connected to the court system or the social service world, you know that DV is a shorthand, a shorthand that's commonly used to describe these kinds of um, crimes. So I realized that I had seen DV elsewhere, and it's in the United States Constitution, in um, Article 4, Section 4, the Guarantee Clause which says, the United States shall guarantee to every state of the union a Republican form of government and shall protect each one of them against invasion on the application of the legislature or the executive when the legislature cannot be convened against domestic violence. So I was quite interested in how this little d, big V can become, and this is the argument of the book, that little d, big V can become big D, big V. And what I mean by big D, big V, is the way that those two letters appear in court documents to signify a domestic violence case. It's a way of quickly identifying through the docket number, might be 2004 DV and then a series of other numbers. That's a quick way for you to identify through court documents that this is a domestic violence trial and that, um, that sign opens up those particular cases for particular forms of analysis and monitoring that are quite different than other criminal cases on, or other, other um, forms of charges. So this book is really about this transformation, which I argue is a transformation that has to do with the archive of slavery. It has to do with the evidence, the archival history of New World slavery, even when um, that evidence appears to not be present, right? So even when the voices or lives of slaves appear to be absent from, our, from the archive, that absence is actually a presence. And so I wanted to bring the archive of slavery to bear upon this change, 
a change that begins to code legal files. Are you with me? Does that make some sense? Okay. Um, so the interesting thing about this moment in the Constitution, this guarantee clause, is that the United States is becoming a republic. It cannot be a monarchy. It cannot be um, a dictatorship, though maybe it can be. Um, but it has to be a republic. And in the moment of the Constitution, when this is being debated, this clause, by the southern and northern states, the southern states interpret domestic violence, the little d, big V, they interpret that as the utter cultural and economic catastrophe that will ensue should slaves become free. So domestic violence is not what you think it is. Right? It is actually about a debate of black folks gaining freedom. And so the image of domestic violence, and I, I use some um, abolitionist photography, the image of domestic violence early on might be um, lithographs or engravings of the civil union army attacking southern plantations. That's domestic violence. So how do we get from an image like that to these image that I just that I began the talk with. That's just really what the book is about. And what I try to do um, is to take attention away from the intimate romantic couple and the visual evidence used to adjudicate it, and throw attention more onto the neighbor, the intimacies of um, the police interacting with with um, with citizens. How much time do I have? 15. Okay. I'm going to fast forward a lot. Um, what would be helpful here? Uh, in black studies, particularly um, black feminist theorists, um, this memoir, slave memoir, is extremely important. Um, it is The Incidents of a Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. Um, who uh, very famously hid in a garret for seven years um, on her captor's property and had a peephole in the garret that she was hiding in and through that garret could see her children playing and her children didn't know that she was hidden away in this space for this amount of time. And in the book, I make a connection between that garret space with the peephole and the camera ob obscura, which is a really important and foundational um, pedagogical tool for those folks who study visual culture and photography and film. Um, it, and I, I won't explain how the camera obscura works, but it's a very similar form um, that I could, that you can imagine um, in the photography uh, that you can imagine in the, the slave memoir, but also that gets made here by a, a white artist named Ellen Driscoll, um, who renders um, Harriet Jacobs' um, loophole of retreat, as she called it. I also think about this um, social media uh, crazy <laughs> dilemma about the dress and the different ways you could see the color, the signification of the color blue, and how um, the Salvation Army would hack that campaign and say, why is it so hard to see black and blue, right? What you should be gathering here and much of the evidence that I've shown you are that these are images of white women's bodies. The white women's body, and this is a really old art history and visual culture argument, there's nothing really new there. Um, but what, what, I, what it allows me to say is that if we go back to this um, guarantee clause, and we know that domestic violence had been something else having to do with black freedom, but it ma makes us ask about this, that what's being, that something is being ghosted here, and it's the freedom struggles of black folk. Okay, I won't go through this one, but you should take a look at it later. Um, as another pedagogical tool, I look at the power and control wheel. This is the sort of cybernetic um, aspect of things, this feedback loop that is used as a pedagogical tool in court cases. Um, and the reason I call this a cybernetic thing is that um, cybernetics is a, is, a, is a language, it's a way of describing the division of labor of machines. How do you program a robot to be able to do labor? And this kind of 
circular wheel uh, cycle function is a similar way of describing a feedback loop of the, the exchange of the, the power dynamic between the couple. And these are tools that attorneys and experts will use in court, domestic violence court cases to help explain to the jury why women stay in these cases and why they sometimes, um, for very good complicated reasons, sabotage their own cases, why they, the overwhelming majority of women do not want to participate in this. Okay, so quickly, this leads me to a, another project um, which I'm calling Critical Marginalia. Um, this is, yeah, this text appears somewhat small, but as I said at the beginning, um, you cannot, bring any recording materials into a courtroom. You have to be low tech. It is an extremely low tech environment. And the first and sixth amendment of the constitution are both a right, they, they are interlocking amendments, meaning that we have the right to assemble and we have the right to a trial of one's peers. We have the right to be seen being accused. And those two um, uh, those two uh, amendments interlock, interlock. Again, I'm using the work of Jocelyn Simonson. Um, so we have the right duty and obligation as audience members, not juries, but audience members to be in a court. So I bring my students in this class, I've created this court watch clinic and we go and we have, I give them a notebook. Um, I insist that the notebook be anonymized and they go and deal with the overwhelming boredom, utter boredom and confusion of the courtroom. They have no idea what's going on. These are folks, um, my campus is really international. They've they revealed to me that they've never been to a courthouse in their own country. They've never been to one in this country. It's incredible for them, they, it gets them moving. Um, and it gets them telling a different set of stories. And I was very intrigued, um, A, by Alyssa Richardson's book, which I adore, um, but also her talk yesterday, and she really um, um, digs into the photographs, into what the photographs and what holding a camera, in a, a student holding a camera can, the power of that. And I actually wanna make a somewhat different argument. There's something about the courtroom space where the phone is not a tool, is not available to young people, that forces you to go low tech and low fi and it forces you to draw and it forces you to write. And what I find interesting is when I um, have students, they, they engage in drawing activities such as this, they engage, they have to write in language that accounts for themselves in the courthouse. They have to deal with this, the griminess, the smelliness of the American court system. The courts are often um, in disrepair. There's a reason for that. Um, I have a student who, um, you know, they, they get up, they get tied into how um, out of date and old and grimy things are. Rather than taking a photograph and saying, we got the picture, we're woke, we understand, we have the critique. What my study is suggesting, because it's located in the courtroom milieu, is these folks do not, are not ideologically the same. They do not carry the same ideas about what it means to document evidence, precisely because they are meant to deal with the utter boredom and confusion of legal language. It slows everything down in a way that your ability to use a smartphone does not do. And so I, I highly recommend this as a pedagogical um, and storytelling um, potential. Um, another. Um, this is a woman uh, who's from Korea who was got really tied into the clothing that they wear. These are also folks that you can see have a manga practice who very quickly are able to engage in storyboarding and that's how, that's how cognitively they're able to process the confusion and, and boredom of the courtroom. Um, I like this circle that she's making, um, this feedback loop that she comes to make. Um, people question the architecture of the court they end up questioning what women are wearing, what, what defendants are wearing, right? You really have to ask yourselves, I mean, I, where I ask myself, what is it that I have here in these reflections and these images that they're drawing? I don't think I have anything. But I think that there is something here, precisely when you put it into context, uh, when you read it against the smartphone and what it can do, and the speed with which people can very quickly capture an image um, 
and with the, the kind of ideological unity or commonality that we assume is in place in the moment of, of bearing witness. Um, here's another um, that really sort of documents very nicely the slow creep of the smartphone in the courtroom. When court watchers, when, sorry, when court officers' bodies are at rest, they get bored and they bust out the phone. And they're not allowed to, but they do it anyway. So the phone is slowly making its way into, into the court system, and that find, I find that fascinating. Um, let's see. These are moments also where rather than meeting the police in the streets, you're meeting them on their turf. You're meeting them, or we're meeting, my students and I are meeting them in their home, and it makes them very nervous. And they start being uh, excessively nice, but sometimes they let something slip. They say things under their breath. Um, and these are really interesting moments um, for us to capture um, without, the use of, without the use of a phone. This is a student, I'm, I'm compelled by this image because of the way that she shows the shackled hands and the back. Um, I might, you know, I would put this into conversation with the history of reading the back um, in, in images, the archive of slavery, but also images of criminality. The sagging back, what that means effectively. One of the things that I try to do in the book is take the attention away from um, all of the affect of reading the face but located in reading other aspects of the body, flesh, the way that your head hangs, et cetera. So conclusions. Here I'm just restating the, um, the, the provocation about the, the closed circuit relationship between evidence and the state. The state controls it all. They control the authentic images, but they also control the fake ones, and we need to be cognizant of that. I want to also suggest that, their, um, that the courtroom audience, their lives and the way that they move through the audience is an absent labor history, and we need to understand it that way. And that um, what they produce in terms of the drawings um, and, 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 and reflections re reflect a diverse set of ideologies. They do not agree. They are not all left-wing. They, are, they have some very conservative ideas, um, and they, those ideas are present in the moment of the court system rather than what we might assume or, or prefer they believe. And following Torin Monaghan, um, the interaction between law and counter-archival or surveillance practices, which are these forms of critical marginalia that I'm talking about, they may serve to blunt their radical potential because, as he says, as people are entrained to participate in systems of data production, they become compliant surveillance subjects whose labor generates value for others, often unbeknownst, unbeknownst to them, end quote. Such that, quote, the very mechanisms that allow for and encourage participations by users in data creation also afford opportunities for artistic interventions that illustrate the insidious logic of supposedly rational systems. I could answer questions about any of those things, um, or I'll be happy to clear up any other things. Okay, thank you. against the state legally become violence against the flesh and then eventually violence against feminine white flesh? Uh, in the book, <laughs> um, I talk about, I try to orient the question fundamentally to the violence of New World slavery and what that means in terms of restricting the freedom of black bodies. I use the work of Hortense Spillers to try and answer that question, where she makes this very famous distinction between the flesh and body. And lots of scholars have, have dug into that moment in her text where she makes that distinction. The flesh is something, as I read her, that can be used to, um, you can control the body, but there's something also, there's something um, different or extra about the ability to control the flesh. And I think that. That, that meaning in her, in her text changes, and I try to show that through the way that the look 
the ideal look of the domestic violence evidence begins to appear as a white woman whose body is used as a blank canvas to show us what domestic violence should look like. And when you put that in conversation with the cosmetically simulated images, what you get is a sort of nice way to train people on how to see these photos in court, right? The, uh, my fundamental argument, or one, one of my arguments, is that the court controls them both. And it opens up, by, by my saying that, it opens up questions around what kind of um, art practices do certain groups engage in? If you were to look at an art history of black women art performances, you don't begin to see bare breasts of, of black women artists, artists until late in the game. That's not the case with the way that white women um, are engaging in radical art practices, the way that they use their bodies. And you could, and I wouldn't, I mean, this is a very American-centric project, I realize, but I really would like to see myself in conversation with um, the way that other folks are theorizing art, art practices. I hope that makes yeah. sense. It does, yeah. thank okay. you. Sure. All right, okay. so I'm going to start at the right, right side of the room with questions, and then we'll move over to the left. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is uh, Heather Lawrence. I'm a doctoral student at Brown University in Modern Hi. Culture and Media. Hi. And my work is actually on the trial as a narrative form, so this talk and your book have been really, really inspirational for me. Okay. And I was wondering, because you mentioned at the beginning of uh, your talk that public, like we're at the highest point of public witnessing in the United States while the actual courtroom trial is decreasing. Yeah. And I think, uh, first I think it's interesting that some of like the most high profile like media mediated trials have been civil trials recently with the Amber Heard, uh, Johnny yeah. Depp case. And then I've personally been watching the, the live stream of Alex Jones's defamation trials. Okay. Um, and I was wondering how this kind of Decrease, how do you think this decrease in like the actual like actual cases going to trial squares with maybe the popularity of true crime media, but also kind of in like sleuthing and the act of kind of investigating, especially on social media in general. It feels very interesting that in reality, like there's not that many cases, but it seems like yeah, you yeah. Get that. Um, I think the. The camera obscura, I think, can help us think about your question, which is, I think, a very good one. Thank you. Um, th this was a scientific object, the camera obscura. It reveals natural phenomena, and it's used for scientific purposes. But as you see, oh, you don't see it. Uh, right, thank you. Um, as you see uh, in these other quad quadrants, this is used by the bourgeoisie as a, as an, and as a leisure, as a form of entertainment, right? So. Particularly you know, in the West, there is a long cultural tradition of inhabiting um, machines and even the lives of others for entertainment purposes. And I think that's part or a lot of what's going on in people's appreciation of true crime. Um, lifetime television for women. There are even, uh, I was at a legal studies conference this summer and heard a wonderful talk about um, conferences that, that happen in, in Las Vegas that are about uh, women staging themselves in, you know, these hor horrific, you know, violence against women acts um, as a form of, of leisure activity, right? As something that's interesting to watch, that's, that's fun um, in the same ways that we like or similar ways that we enjoy horror, other sorts of genres um, that seem distasteful. They are very, very pleasurable. Um, and I'm quite interested in, in describing what kind of aesthetic category do we need to describe that feeling or that the participation in those kinds of activities? Um, yeah, I hope that answers it a little bit. Hello. Hey. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, Cherise Lepree, uh, Associate Professor at Newhouse. How are you? Hi. Um, I, I have two kind of very divergent points, but um, one of which I can't, and going through your talk, I can't help thinking about Todd Atkin, Aiken, and his comment, I think he passed away a few years ago, uh, about legitimate rape, right? Yeah. And legitimate rape, women have a whole, women's bodies have a whole way of shutting that thing down. Mm -hmm. um, 
And you know, this idea of what is legitimate violence and what is illegitimate violence. And when we talk about violence against, say, black and brown bodies, and we've had those conversations, um, that it's technically legitimized, right? Because it's part of the rules of state and so on and so forth. But at the same time, the emphasis on visual evidence keeps us from understanding, say, emotional violence. So mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. I, I don't really have a question, but I feel like there's this real intersecting positionality of what we can bear witness to, what we can yeah. see versus what we can't see and what we choose not to see yeah. um, with respect to the racialized understanding of what is legitimate violence against which bodies. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, your talk makes me think again about these instruments, these power and control wheels, and all the things that are not represented. The archive of slavery is not in this, in these instruments. Um, and the assumptions that we bring to these instruments are that the, and, and this is borne out in, in, the, in the cases, is that we are always thinking that these are cases of female victims and male perpetrators. And that is what you see overwhelmingly. It's what I saw overwhelmingly um, in the ethnographic work I did watching these trials. But the dynamic here describes the trans couple. It describes the queer couple. Um, it describes all couples. It describes female perpetrators as well. And so I think your, your um, comment really makes me um, think about that and, and really try to I would like to think that the book can open that question up too, that, that we're in this moment where we're you know, finally celebrating queer lives and people loving who they like, but there is a, there's a whole bunch of work that's gonna need to come out about violence and control in those relationships as well and how that goes down just as it does for straight folks. And very briefly, the other note that I wanted was... Um, it, and that work is already ongoing, sorry is, uh, and not to make it about myself, today is my fifth year anniversary, uh, and so I'm here, and <laughs> my husband is not, um, but we got married in the courthouse, right? And so, you know, thinking through that experience of, there was only two couples getting married that day, and all of our families were there to literally bear witness to this courtroom process, but there were also people who were there for courtroom processes. And I think mm -hmm. the woman that I remember most clearly was the woman who was bearing witness to our wedding unintentionally because she had something else coming up after we did this whole marriage thing for these happy couples. Right. And I, I really am excited about the idea of what it means to bear witness in a courtroom when there is no videography or that you can participate in that videography. It's taken out of the hands of the people. Yeah. And I don't know, now I'm just, I really wonder who that woman was. And I kind of yeah. want to go back and find out who bear witness to our wedding, yeah. our yeah. marriage. Uh, for very, very different reasons. Very, very different reasons. Thank and you. there were two very different contracts being put into play, your marriage contract and her perhaps way of using visual evidence to contract her way into the Violence Against Women Act, which is the, this act that takes the pressure um, off of the victim to charge uh, the batterer, right? It's not women, it's not the victim who brings those cases, it's the state. Right, that discretion is, is, that agency is taken off of the victim's hands for all sorts of reasons. And I'm quite interested um, in how the law ends up having to do that, um, given the, the nature of the, the kind of power and control dynamic that's being described here, which, I, which has just haunted me for, for, for the longest time. Thank you for that, yeah. Um, my name is Jake Zaslov. Uh, and I was really fascinated by your discussion of boredom um, and I think attention and coming from a music background, there's a lot in ambient music studies about how in a space where there is little that's actually going on, the attention tends to um, really hone in on very different topics than you would in a much busier context, which I think you discuss greatly with your students' observations. So I was wondering for you personally though, what do you tend to notice in those um, places of boredom? What really begins to draw your eyes in those courtrooms? Um, I'm really a theory person, <laughs> so I, I'm really interested in what the boredom might suggest and the ways that boredom has to be un overcome. Um, and I use uh, a theorist, uh, 
theorist by the name of C.N. Nye to talk about that. Um, she's, I think, one of the most, offered some of the most intelligent thinking about aesthetic categories. Um, and she has this idea of, um, she sort of looks at the history of affect and emotion and how we study it in, in liberal cultures. And the emphasis when we're when, in studies of, of emotions, the human affect system, let's say, and feelings, um, the emphasis is always on what she calls the grand affects, shame, um, joy, uh, anger, really big topics, really big grand affects. But her, she wants to place emphasis on something that she calls the minor affects, confusion, concern, disorientation, boredom. Those things don't seem very serious, but she makes this really interesting political argument that it's precisely those minor aff affects of which awkwardness is included that we really need to turn to to address problems in a liberal democracy. It's precisely the, when awkwardness has the power to stall a conversation, that confusion actually produces all sorts of legitimate misunderstandings amongst groups and people and individuals, that, that where crosstalk ends up happening and so you don't end up really connecting with a person and really listening or really understanding. And boredom in the courtroom is one of those spaces where you really, the students and, and I, we really have to deal with our bodies and our feelings in that moment to come to understanding. I think, it'll, I think, I think you know, using you know, Nye's theory, it, it, I guess it helps me understand the conditions of, of having your consciousness unfold. Uh, in, a, in a way that I think is different when you're taking a picture. Um, and, and it makes you more attuned to why you don't understand something, why you don't understand the, draw, the genre, how, you how it is that you have to deal with drawing a picture and accounting for yourself while also listening to other people account for themselves. Communication is very difficult. I mean, it's a miracle that it happens. It's a miracle that it works. Um, so. It, I hope that somewhere in there that's a, there's a response yeah. uh, to it. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I'm trying to see you because the, the light. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, this is more of a statement rather than a question. Um, what if the person, well, it's a question. Well, what if the person is not viable to listening and like the only way of listening is seeing pictures to t like tell their story or to get other people to hear their story rather than them listening. Because you're talking about in the courthouse where they're not listening. Um, there's a thing called double consciousness and people know that you're not listening. People know the stereotypes that people have for you. So like, what would you have to say about that? Um. Different forms of communication get enacted in that moment, right? When you're not heard, all sorts of you know calamities can ensue, you know, through physical uh, violence um, that can happen. Other people engage; they run through a, a litany of ways of communicating when listening breaks down. Um, in the in the courtroom cases and the in the around the issue of domestic violence. Um, one thing that happens that I could tell you about is there are some photographers who work with battered women. I talk about this in the book. There are photographers who work with battered women um, who engage in a kind of therapeutic practice with them by having, giving them a makeover and then photographing them and showing them the beautiful pictures that resulted. And a lot of those women, those victims of, of DV, they are really engaged by that kind of therapy. And it really, they cry, they're very moved, they're very happy to see themselves as they should be seen, rather than the ways that they have regarded themselves in mirrors, for example, with bruises on their bodies, et cetera. So this is a way that has nothing to do with anything being said. It's a kind of therapeutic practice that's led by photographers to just put makeup on in the same way that um, survivors of cancer your friend, you know, friends might shave their heads, you know, during chemotherapy, or um, refuse to wear a wig, or wear a wig, or do some sort of other um, makeover kind of cosmetic activity. Right? This doesn't have anything to do with being um, heard in terms of 
you know, spoken language, right? It's other ways of, of, um, of engaging with people communicatively that seems to be very helpful. Yeah, I hope that can answer your question a little bit. We have time for one or two questions. Um, so I have a question. I'm struck uh, by your research and some of the parallels with some work that I'm doing right now as well regarding the way the visual press can and cannot cover executions in the United States and how cameras are kept outside of the building yeah. while the state is able to kill another human being. And my, my question to you is, is whether we're talking about domestic violence, cases within the court, or something like an execution, what, what ought we, what would we like the public to be able to see? Because clearly there's certain things that we, we don't want them to see. But normatively, what would we like them to be able to understand visually about what is happening before us regarding the state and violence and the state's power here? Yeah, that's a really beautiful question, um, and I, I don't quite have an answer except to say that, for example, my book was not written to try and get some policy changes about how to improve images for when women are, or victim, other victims are dark-skinned. It's a problem. It's a problem of the technology and how your skin behaves on camera and the light and all of that. But I didn't write this book to try and get the images improved. That's not quite the question that I was interested in, and I don't know that that would work, especially given the ways that we, I mean, the Rodney King trial has come up many times in, in the sessions here, and all of the, you know, the evidence in a number of other cases um, that we've been through in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, et cetera. Um, it's not about improving the image or the angle at which you are shooting the material or shooting, shooting the events. Um, and I think perhaps in the case of, um, of, of state executions, I'd almost wish the public would have to, on the one hand, I would wish that the public would have to see it all and hear it all, the loss that the relatives are going to experience on both sides, right? And then on the other hand, um, Shoot, I'm just losing my train of thought. Oh, and then on the other hand, if you look at the history of people going to courthouses, it was a bunch of racist, sexist, paternalistic people who went to courthouses really dutifully and was really happy to watch executions, very happy to watch you know, horrible decisions that ended up getting people lynched, thrown in jail, et cetera. So even the history, it's, I don't want to suggest that um, that court watching is, you know, uh, a, any kind of cure-all, right? Or that disclosing information in that way is any kind of cure-all because the history of the watching is not a nice one. So I, I, I think your question really opens up an impasse and I appreciate it. I don't know the answer to that actually, but thank you. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. Can I add one other piece of evidence to that thought process is where uh, the flag-draped coffins post-Iraq war that we were not allowed to see or there was, you know, legal efforts to prevent the publication of those images through because of state-sponsored violence, legitimate violence, right? So I just wanted to put that one out there to add into the formula of yeah, your cognitive yeah. processing. Yeah, no, it's good. There was a really beautiful talk I went to yesterday by an indigenous of Maori scholar named Latoya, I don't have the last name. But she offered a beautiful memorial in many ways of a relative who was killed uh, using uh, um, a spit hood. And her family kind of replicated that killing through the use of a spit hood, but they used, they represented it artistically. And similarly to the um, faked, the cosmetically simulated images that I talk about, what happened um, in, as a way of memorializing uh, her, her, her family that was killed was they, they called upon the very forms of the state. They got allies to dress up in uniforms that looked like prison guards. They got a car that looked like 
you know, a, a police car, prison vehicle, and they fed it back to the system, so to speak. And I think that kind of work, that kind of project, um, Sharice, you're helping me maybe triangulate between this question that I just got before you, um, about finding ways for the state to see what has been done to us. But then again, we have this art practice of really enjoying inhabiting the lives and pain of others um, in, uh, in our leisure activities, right? We enjoy watching that stuff and participating in that stuff. So this actually helps bring us back to this cybernetics question and the loop, this feedback that we just don't seem to be able to, to break out of and, and I think perhaps, I think that I feel that that's where, I, I've, where I've ended the project in a way and I'm really beginning to think about that feedback loop and how to live and work outside of it. Uh, yeah, so to, to theorize that space in a different way. I have a final question related to that feedback yeah. loop because throughout your talk I was wondering and understanding that your project is very much scrutinizing our scrutinization of visual imagery why is the courtroom the best space to analyze these visual images or this evidence, knowing that it does strip a lot of the context away from the victims as opposed to, say, some kind of entertainment? The one that comes to yeah. mind might be the color purple that traces the connections between slavery and domestic violence quite clearly. Yes, I don't claim that the court is the best space. It's the space that I was brought to in this first project. Um, one of the things that the project opened up for me through thinking about the court space and thinking about art and law and authentic things and fake things is this concept of theatricality, which is not the same as performativity. And I, there's something about the forms of the theater, the law of the theater, how the theater works, such that we know we're in a theater, such that we know when something is official versus not official. And, I, and it's a difficult concept to define in performance studies. There's some discussion about it. So I'm thinking about that at the moment. So it's, I, I don't claim that the court is the best space. Mm -hmm. um, because, and if I did claim that, I wouldn't be able to really engage people who genuinely like true crime or watching theater and that you know there, there really is good television and good theater out there that produces change. I mean, it, that, that does happen. I, if I were to say that the court is the best space, I, I couldn't speak to those folks very well. Mm -hmm. right. right. So that's kind of the next step, which yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Right. We're out of time. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. You. Thank you.